Um, good evening. Uh, when John Gould asked me to give this talk, gosh, it feels a bit loud. Um, so keep going, okay, and then you'll adjust, fine. Um, and he left the choice of topic up to me, so it could have been autonomous underwater vehicles, underwater sonar, but I thought, what's going to pack the hall? Weather! <laughs> weather! So except for our Australian visitor, then, you know, the British and weather. But I thought I'd do something different, so talk about space weather. And when I think of space weather, um, Aurora came to mind immediately. And then the causes of the aurora, the disturbances to the Earth's magnetic field. So that gave me the wandering compasses bit. And, and then as a radio amateur, I thought, well, I'd, let's throw in radio blackouts as well to cover three aspects of space weather. Now, now here's a confession for you. Um, it, it may already be clear that I am a complete amateur and a student of 50 years standing on space weather and radio. I have no professional qualifications whatsoever to stand in front of you and talk about space weather. But it's a passion. And there's nothing wrong with amateur science. We probably need far more amateur science. And certainly in retirement, uh, it's been a true delight and it's a terrific hobby that brings you into contact with a lot of people. Now, like many of my generation growing up in the 60s, um, valve radios abounded, and you could take them apart, you could get them for nothing, the retailer would gladly give you to get them off his hands. And you'd take them apart and try and put them back together again with greater or lesser success. And there was a lot of surplus equipment from World War II, and my dear parents bought a PCR, a Pi Communications Receiver. There it is in black, just under the letters PCR3 there. And I graduated when I became licensed as GW3ZIL in Anglesey, North Wales, taking my Morse test at Point Linus. There we are. Yes. Um, uh, but radio featured not a jot in my career. Um, so I did more sonar than radio. Uh, and but uh, a very practical career with electronics. So the synopsis really for my talk tonight, uh, I'm going to say something about the solar cycle and why this year is a pretty terrific year for anybody to talk to you about space weather and bring examples of what's been happening this month, what's been happening last month. If I was to give this talk three years ago, it would have been rather dull. Um, I'm going to talk about magnetometers, and I brought one along on the table over there that you can look at afterwards. It's tiny, uh, but it can detect things happening to our sphere of force field. The magneto magnus magno <laughs> magnetosphere around the Earth. Uh, then, why I was really glad that John asked me to bring the talk forward was that there was a really severe geomagnetic storm last month. So that gives me plenty of recent context uh, for that part of it. I'm going to talk a little bit about modern digital protocols for the radio amateur and how we can make measurements and then how we can see the effects of radio blackouts. And then, at the end, because I think there's far too much doom and gloom, I'm going to mention the fact that extreme space weather is on the UK's National Risk Register and why it's there and a nice example, a modern example, of why you shouldn't set sail into a storm. So there is an 11-year cycle to the activity of the sun. Chinese and Korean astronomers 2,000 years ago could observe spots, those dark areas on the surface of the sun. They saw that they moved. They saw that they changed in number. But it was really the Galileo and uh, others at around the early 17th century with the introduction of the telescopes who started to count sunspots. And they saw that they moved across the surface of the spun sun, giving them the clue that the sun rotated. 
And so we have in the top there a uh, record of the number of sunspots for over uh, 400 years. And the instrumental record recently, of course, is far more accurate and uh, comprehensive, really. Uh, and there are long-term changes, and then there is this 11-year cycle, uh, which I've shown expanded for the recent decades below. And now the big controversy over solar cycle 25, which is where we are now, the predictions from the wise people was the red curve. And I think they're sticking by that, but there's quite a bit of controversy over new methods of trying to predict sunspots. And the actual number is following that blue curve. So I've got my fingers crossed for a bumper solar cycle. I'd be wrong, maybe I don't know how past it I'll be in 11 years' time to take part in the next one. So as ever with NASA, they do absolutely fantastic graphics and they make them publicly available. The, the one caveat on this, of course, is not to scale. But then that you can't do that. But it's wonderful. It's a great image. So if I start from the left, so we have the sun, we have the active sun, we have dark areas for sunspots, we have bright areas there in uh, yellow for a solar disturbance, a solar flare. And then there's material coming out of the sun, those thin, wispy filaments. Uh, they are protons. They are the nuclei of hydrogen atoms from the nuclear reactor of the sun. They are being thrown out into space. Now, you get some impression from the number of satellites up there on how seriously Sat NASA takes the observations of the sun. And indeed, so does ESA, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese. So what's the graphic showing here now? In yellow, that is part of the s a stream that's previously come from the sun it's making our way, its way towards the Earth, and then, boom, it hits something. It can't go any further in this direction. It's deflected. It's deflected by the Earth's magnetosphere. That's in blue. And I'll give you a clue, but very important to virtually this, this whole talk. Are these thin wisps here? Because what happens is that those particles find their way down on the, along these magnetic field lines for the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And that's the cause of everything I'm talking about today. There is, uh, the UK Met Office has uh, on its website uh, a page dedicated to space weather. Um, it's rather text heavy for me. I prefer this one from the US Space Weather Prediction Center. Uh, it's a quick look graphical dashboard about now what's happening and what's likely to happen. Um, and it's got three videos that you can play up at the top and then for those people that love graphs it's got three proper graphs at the bottom. Uh, so this one is a satellite image of the sun's disk in the extreme UV, very short ultraviolet wavelengths, and X-rays. So this radiation, once it's left the sun, eight minutes and just a bit over, and it's hitting us. So that's guaranteed, eight and a bit minutes. It's not going to change. Nothing we can do about it. It'll hit us. Extreme UV and x-rays. And this activity here varies with the solar cycle. It would be like this, that red trace, or even lower, that red trace would probably be a bit lower, and it would be there for only the entire seven days of that plot if I showed you that three years ago, more than likely. I'd have chosen a good one, but still, more than likely it would be flat. But here we are, we've got a series of solar flares now, the solar flare index isn't as easy as the Beaufort scale or the Richter scale. Um, and so it's X is the highest class, and then one-tenth of the energy is M class, one-tenth the energy of that is C, then B, then A, and, and uh, well, that's virtually the background level. Um, but here, here's an M class flare. 
uh, on that day from the sun. Now this image is where you have a disk in front of the sun, so you obscure that, but then you see, in, it gives you contrast to see the particle streams coming off the sun. So that's in that coronal mass ejections, a, a mass ejection of material from the corona of the sun. Now we're not talking radiation now, we're talking particles protons. So they don't go as fast. They don't go at the speed of light. They travel at about 600 kilometers per second. Okay, that's fast, but it's going to take two or three days for these protons to arrive at the Earth. And a lot can happen in two or three days. Then this graph here um, is the forecast of the aurora. Uh, it tells you what the, the last day has been and a forecast period out to about 45 minutes. And at this time of day when I took the snapshot, the aurora here was over northern Canada and Alaska. And you can see that it forms a halo. That is the auroral region. You're going to find more prevalent aurora uh, in Alaska, northern Canada, northern Finland, Norway, than you would at the North Pole. Okay, so we have an auroral oval, so if you go too far north, you'll, you'll stop seeing the aurora. Oh, and down here is the Geomagnetic Disturbance Index, K, KP. Uh, green in here is quiet, moderate, it's not stormy, this is you know, force 3 on the Beaufort scale. Now we're getting into active, in if it was yellow, orange and then red and that's what we saw last month the reds so there we are the auroral oval and these uh, diamonds are from radio amateur friends of mine whose results and information I'm drawing on uh, to illustrate this talk so uh, there's Heike in northern Finland we've got one on Ellesmere Island Another one on Inuvik, which is uh, Canadian Northwest Territories, about 100 kilometers in from the Arctic Ocean. Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, Long Island, and me in Southampton. And also this auroral oval here. Um, now, as I'm a student, I can use silly analogies. Uh, and in our houses, we all have a ring main for our power distribution, a cable that, that forms a ring, and we've got our uh, 13 amp sockets on, on that ring. This is a sort of ring main. As well as the aurora, we don't see it, but there is the auroral electrojet. So it's a ring of current in the plasma, the ionized uh, material of the ionosphere, and normally it might be 10,000 amps. You can go up 100,000, a million amps can flow in the auroral electrojet. And the particles affect the auroral electrojet. So we have the steady magnetic field from the Earth's core, and we have a variable magnetic field from the auroral electrojet. So the auroral glow comes from different uh, atoms in the ionosphere. And this is a photograph by, by my friend in northern Sweden, um, it's northern Finland, um, of the aurora of the 23rd of April uh, last month. So these high-speed particles, the protons, are funneled down the magnetic field lines into the upper atmosphere where they excite oxygen and nitrogen. The atmosphere there in the ionosphere at these heights of 100 to 400 kilometers is very thin. It is very thin indeed. And what's more, normal solar radiation has split the O2, the oxygen molecule, into monoatomic oxygen, O and O. And, and they hardly ever can get to meet up again to form O2. Uh, so it's monoatomic oxygen emits green, which is what we see. It's the most likely color for an aurora. And then it's red at a higher altitude. So up here you might see a red 
but it's very faint. And down below, there is this touch of red as a skirt to the green aurora, and that's caused by nitrogen at altitudes of about 100 kilometers. So keep 100 to 400 kilometers in mind as the height of the ionosphere above the Earth. So what about this 23rd of uh, April uh, this, uh, aurora that could be seen down in the south of England? What was the cause? Very clear about the cause. It was a coronal mass ejection. So this magnetic filament in the southern hemisphere of the sun suddenly snapped. An enormous amount of energy was released in that. And as that exploded, I think you can just, it's very faint, but you can see that, that on that shadow there, the particles being ejected from the sun. So about 580 kilometers per second was their estimate from the European Space Agency satellites. And, and that's a satellite 9.3 million miles away from you. And I actually do think it's wonderful that these satellites can remain in orbit and functional for so long. 13 years there. So now we come to the prediction part. So we know exactly when the coronal mass ejection happened on the surface of the Sun. What we don't know so well is how fast it's going to travel, so when it's going to reach us, and how uh, the, the severity. So both NASA and Met Office have these sorts of models. So there in yellow is the Sun, uh, there in green is the Earth, and then there's their computer models of this material making its way from the Sun towards the Earth, spreading out as it does so, perhaps changing its speed, and now there are two satellites called Stereo A and Stereo B. Uh, and that's Stereo B, this is Stereo A. And they are able to look to the side of the sun so that they can see uh, any active areas on the sun that just before it rotates to face us and the Earth. So that's how they get some prior warning of things that may happen in the days to come. So that it hits a uh, stereo, stereo, stereo A, and there's this, uh, st oh, sorry, Earth, Stereo A, Stereo B, and that's when it uh, hit the Earth according to the model. And they made a prediction, and it goes out on the website. It could uh, spark moderate, minor to moderate geomagnetic storms on the 24th. That was their prediction on the 22nd. Uh, but it was far more severe than that. So here's you know, Yahoo News, that great source. Stargazers in Britain, as far south as the English Channel, auroras uh, were seen. But, uh, I mean, just to get a decent picture, this is one from Finland again. <laughs> um, so, you know. so uh, I don't know, did anybody happen to hear about this and look far north? Did you live out in the countryside sufficiently? Yes? Yeah? You tried? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is, you know, part of the issue. But, 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 I didn't see the aurora in, in Bassett in Southampton, but I did measure it. I did measure the storm. And I did that with the magnetic field. So those particles had an impact on the Earth's magnetic field that I detected. So he here is, uh, well, how do you measure a magnetic field? Because you use a magnetometer. Um, and there is one on that table over there connected up. And we'll have a look at that at, at question time or afterwards. Uh, but it's tiny. You know, that's 25 millimeters there. And it's a tiny price as well, really, 37 pounds. And you connect it up to a Raspberry Pi computer that takes the data on board and does magic things with it. Um, and the actual sensors are even smaller. That one detects you know, the Y component of the field. This is the X, and then this is the Z, the vertical component of the field. And so the Earth's field, about where we are, is about 50 micro teslas. Uh, this unit of magnetic flux density, tesla. 50 micro tesla. So if you go into an MRI, you have maybe five tesla. 
uh, sunspots are red there. Yeah, don't go near a milli Tesla if you've got a pacemaker. A fridge magnet is a couple of milli Teslas right up next to it. Uh, power lines, a toaster from this example, 0.3 meters from a toaster, there we are. And this is the noise level of that 37 pound magnetometer. It's way down there, about 2 nano Tesla. But the problem is, it varies 30 nano Tesla for every degree centigrade. So it's a better thermometer in a way. Uh, um, and so what you do is you have to insulate it. Of course, if you spend tens of thousands of pounds as a national center, you can uh, have a magnetometer that uh, is not so sensitive to temperature and has an even lower noise level. So now the wandering compasses. Um, yes. Mm. Well, uh, le let me talk first about Finland. Because as we know, Finland do well with the visual aurora, so you'd expect them to do well with wandering compasses. And so these uh, dark purple dots are the compass um, at, uh, at Heike in northern Finland. And there, you can see there's a change. It suddenly starts to go all over the place and it, the magnitude is about plus two degrees and maybe minus two degrees. So the compass in northern swim Finland would swing plus and minus two degrees due to the geomagnetic disturbance of that April 2023 storm. So I, I, I think I've done enough there to say that yes, I've covered wandering compasses, but if I only had my own data in Southampton, which is orange here, um, you know, you'd be hard pressed. You'd be wanting your money back. Um, but you can see that, that you know, even though the, no the noise level here is pretty steady, these disturbances here um, are, are real disturbances, but they are quite small here in Southampton, I in line with the fact that the aurora just isn't as strong. Um, so if we say that the wandering at Southampton wasn't particularly impressive, what I think is really impressive, well, yes, for us, for us radio amateurs, is this graph. So the predictions weren't quite right on timing or magnitude. So here I am in the garden, there's the shed with some electronics in it, and 70 centimeters beneath the ground there is the buried magnetometer. So it talks to a Raspberry Pi in that little box there and then onto the network. And now what I've done is to plot a magnetic anomaly. Now John Gould could tell you all about anomalies. How, how you forget the average. So I take the average for a whole day because that's 50 micro Tesla as an average. I take that, I subtract it from the data and I look just at the variations through a day. And so on the 23rd, here we are, these little variations here, pretty smooth, and then bang. It's a step. It happened within two minutes. There's no data in that little gap there. Bang. That's the shock impact of that proton stream at 600 kilometers per second hitting the magnetosphere of the Earth. And that causes a change in the magnetic field buried uh, in my garden. And it's buried, of course, to keep the temperature stable. And then the, ma uh, the magnetosphere rings, changes like that, through the day after it's had that shock to it. Now, okay, I, I have to say that I was a fan in my teenage years of the American TV uh, science fiction program, Lost in Space. And one of the key instruments, devices that they had out there on the alien planet was a force field generator. They needed that to put out a force field so that they could live safely within the confines of that force field. Now we on planet Earth benefit from the natural force field. We have one. We need one. And that natural force field is the uh, magnetosphere. That's what keeps us safe down on the surface of the Earth from a heck of a lot of those particles that would rain down. Now in Finland, um, the step wasn't quite so clear, uh, but there we are, big ringing. But look at the scale. That's 0 to 500. I'm 0 to 50 in my tick interval. 
So these excursions here in Finland are ten times what they were in my back garden. And, and Heike, um, fi fin uh, uh, he's proud of insulation, so he said, no, 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 I'll insulate, I know how to insulate things. I will insulate it, uh, the ma his magnetometer inside a box with insulation and then in a cooler uh, and so on and so forth, a, a Russian doll approach. Um, so, how good is this magnetometer? 37 quid. Well, here's my friend Glenn in Colorado. He's got a top hat approach to insulating his magnetometer with a guard dog. But this is 40 kilometers away, the US Geological Survey site, way out in the middle of nowhere. And I, I wouldn't like to think how much their instruments cost. And here is a comparison of their data for that storm. Um, and the small scale variations, pretty good. You know, they really look at that deep spike, that's fair. But what's happening is that Glenn's temperature is changing. It's going up and down in temperature. And so these slow changes of coming together and going apart is the temperature drift of Glenn's magnetometer. But that's not bad for 37 quid. So what about modern tools for the radio amateur? Um, this is a bit of a Marmite subject. Uh, there are those, of course, who adhere to voice communication, analog voice communication, and the Morse code. Uh, but this man, Joe Taylor, an active radio amateur and the 1993 Nobel laureate in physics, with many collaborators, uh, came up with a suite of digital communications protocols. And one of them, called FT8, is, is taken the world by storm. Um, I'm not going to talk FT8, but I am going to talk about some other digital communications protocols that, that Joe and his colleagues have invented uh, and are really useful. So a modern day amateur radio piece of equipment, for especially for digital protocols, does not look like the radios I took apart in my youth. Th there are no dials, there are no knobs to twiddle. Um, it looks almost like a black box. Well, that one is actually a black box. Uh, I don't have that one with me, but I do have a version of this one with me in the, in the yellow box there. Um, and, and this one is a digital modes transceiver. It's not expensive. As a kit, $69. You know, and, and the great fun is, is building um, the parts of it yourself that you can see. The, the, the larger components, uh, all of the modern tiny, tiny surface mount components um, come ready soldered. So it's not too difficult to build. For $69, it's terrific. This one is a bit more, uh, 250 pounds, and, uh, but it can operate over a very wide bandwidth in the very low frequencies up to the short wave, the high frequency band, and it gives you eight radios simultaneously for 250 quid. That's not bad eight channels simultaneously. So what do you do with all of that? Um, if, if I had a day job, uh, this is it. Uh, it's what you do with it. How do you manage the data coming from uh, a particular system called Whisper, Weak Signal Propagation Reporter, Whisper, a mode that Joe Taylor invented. And, and this is purely digital but we need to store records of communication paths, the start point, the end point, uh, the signal to noise ratio, which is how strong the received signal was compared to local noise, um, and the signal power of the transmitter. So um, th there is a database there in, in purple, that is the main one, whispernet.org, but with uh, a number of friends, we, we've augmented that to get additional data and additional modes come in. And although it's an amateur effort, we sort of take it seriously. So there's about 5 million data records a day that come into this database from about 4,000 Whisper users uh, worldwide. And we make that available to anybody uh, two minutes after it's been acquired. And there are uh, triplicated servers uh, for this, the main server is in a data center in Silicon Valley at a t what's called a tier one internet site. It's serious business, but it's all self-funded. Don't have to write a research grant, don't have to write a report or anything. Um, it's terrific. And so what can you see from these whisper 
uh, signal reports. Well, here's a graphical interface by another colleague, uh, Phil, VK7JJ, his call sign in Tasmania. And, and this is just 10 minutes. Just, just 10 minutes, all of these radio paths were reported, um, over 5,000 of them. Uh, on the 30th of April, and you can immediately see the centers of, of, uh, of radio interest in Europe, in North America, Australia, uh, Japan, and hardly anything in, in South America or uh, Africa. And that's a great pity, but all of this information is coming in. What can we see? What can we do with it? Um, so we go back now to radio blackouts, and the radio blackouts due to extreme UV and x-rays. So there we are, or this X28 solar flare on the 28th of October 2003. That was big enough to saturate the sensors on the satellite. The satellite wasn't designed for that level of X-class flare, but it's by no means the largest. The largest one known uh, was on the 1st of September 1859, the so-called Carrington event. If another one of those happened, <coughs> things may fall apart. So the very benign outcome from a solar flare is a ra solar radio noise burst. So this is one that um, my, my friends and I, we, we found on the 7th of May 2021, and so on the y-axis we have the noise level at receivers from New York State, by Oregon, Utah, California, and across to Maui, the Hawaiian Islands. So, um, and you can see an upsurge in the noise and then a decay in exactly the same time and exactly the same duration at each of those sites. And those were the sites that could see the sun at the same time. That's what they had in common. So this was noise coming from the sun, affecting radio receivers all the way from uh, New York State uh, to Maui. But that's pretty benign. A different form of, uh, uh, of radio bla is now a radio blackout rather than an additional noise. A radio blackout, again, due to X-ray and extreme UV radiation. And again, you know, we, we're in active time, so this one is 1st of May, just a few weeks ago, and that was an M7 solar flare, that big spike there, nearly an X-class, and that produced a, um, a, an absorption in the ionosphere on the sun-facing side of the Earth. And I've got this one as an example because it was, you know, it happened at 1308 uh, UTC, Universal Time, GMT. Um, and we, this image is created from a model by uh, the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And there we are, the big absorption uh, the big blackout was over the Atlantic. But, of course, we, we go from the UK to the Canary Islands, uh, just on the fringe of that. And so, now in this graph, we've got sort of signal level, signal to noise ratio on the y-axis and time of the day on the x-axis, and the blue dots are the signal level. And um, so there we are, and then 1308, I've had to put in a red dot because my transmission was not heard. There was just too much absorption at exactly the time when the solar flare uh, hit, hit the, the, the impact hit the Earth. Um, and we got that absorption. And then there was a steady rise uh, for the next 30 minutes uh, as the ionosphere recovered from that blast uh, of radiation. Now a different sort of radio blackout is called the polar cap absorption. So this is when those protons come in and again they're funneled down the Earth's magnetic field lines in the polar regions. So this one isn't across the Atlantic, this one is in north and south. They go to the north and into the south funneling down those nearly vertical lines of magnetic field there and there. Um, and now I've got this graphic that is a bit different but um, this is the, uh, the number of reception reports received by the station, amateur radio station at Inuvik, so Northwest Territories, Canada. Um, and here, the y-axis is time of day. So midnight, 
midday in the middle and back to midnight at the bottom and then each column is one day from 2nd of April to 2nd of May and the colour tells you how many stations were received each half hour red a lot, blue hardly any, black none uh, and you can see that on the 23rd of April things changed there was this pattern of more spots in the very early hours of the morning UTC before the event and then um, a sudden change and a true blackout there so we see different effects and, and then of course what happens is that the next flare comes along and, and it never fully recovers <coughs> now an interesting one that um, I, I looked at for a, a, a blackout was uh, 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 over North America on the 3rd of November 2021 a so-called cannibal coronal mass ejection and what happened here is that the Sun was sending out pulse after pulse after pulse of material over a few days and it just happened that the early ones were the slow traveling ones and then the later ones were the faster ones and by the Earth's magnetosphere, they'd all caught up with each other to give a big peak. You know, it's like the waves coming together and you get a big peak. So this was an unusual one, a cannibal coronal mass ejection hit Earth. Um, and we're going to look at the radio blackout from my friend Glenn in Colorado. And he's listening to stations from this area, this grid in uh, eastern North America uh, on that day. And again, we're going to look at oh, um, oh, two graphs. Um, we're going to look at a graph that's showing the number of reception reports in 30-minute intervals. So that's what's on the um, the y-axis, and then time of day uh, on on the x-axis. And a normal day in the sort of yellow, orangey brown comes up like this, goes down and then back up and this this dip here is perfectly normal it happens every day around noon when the Sun generates sufficient radiation to cause the ionosphere to absorb the radio signals at those frequencies um, happens every day it's not unusual it's very smooth very predictable but then the difference was on the 4th of November at this time sudden collapse way down and, and just one or two spots and those were probably uh, and, and, and then a recovery but this one lasted three hours this, this radio blackout so my current investigations this is sort of things I'm getting up to right now is to uh, not just look at the number of reception reports but to look at the, the frequency spread now to me this is a bit of a wobble on, on the frequency. It's a bit like vibrato on a violin where you get some wobbling and that wobbling comes from the variations in the motion within the ionosphere. It's turbulent, it's moving about and it spreads the signal and the more turbulent it is the more it's affected by the storms, the geomagnetic storms, the more spread you get. And of course you get more spread up near the auroral oval than you do across the Atlantic to New York and we can measure that so the green spots are the spectral spread here um, and, and this is small we're talking millihertz uh, the, the, the w one, one hertz one cycle per second is 1000 millihertz so the green is across the Atlantic and the purple d uh, squares are to the receiver on Ellesmere Island uh, up there and I think what's terrific about amateur radio is that all of this again is at no cost there's no professionals involved um, this is done for the love of the subject and so but you have these globally diverse sites that you can draw upon um, and anyway so that that's that's current investigations so as I draw to towards the end, uh, so here we are, this is why space weather is on the UK National Risk Register. And there is an extremely well written report by the Royal Academy of Engineering on the various aspects of extreme space weather, what effects they can have and what should be done about them. Now, now I'm really quite pleased to, to have seen in that that the UK national grid really does have its house in order um, and has things like this map of disturbance fields and then uh, each dot there is a, a node on the on the national grid there we are I guess that's that sort of Foley area um, 
and all 1,100 big transformers on the UK network are fully modelled for their characteristics as to how they will be disturbed by a geomagnetic event. So that's, that, that's really quite encouraging. And of course, instructions have gone out to telecommunications providers, your mobile phone providers, that they should ensure that they can live without GPS or other na uh, navigation satellites to give them timing for periods of up to three days. That's an indication of how long systems like GPS may be disturbed if we were to have another uh, uh, Carrington event. But we don't need anything like that scale of disturbance to really have a significant and embarrassing impact. So this is the parallel of in years gone by the sailing fleet setting out to sea having been told that there's a storm out there but they sail nevertheless. Well Mr. Musk and SpaceX did just that. They did just that. So there was a coronal mass ejection, 29th of January, 2022. And as we know, that takes two or three days to arrive at Earth. So, you know, they, they knew about it. Uh, it was issued as a minor storm warning. 3rd to the 4th of February, minor storm conditions prevail. But on the 3rd, SpaceX launched a rocket with 49 satellites on it. And uh, then the rocket then seeds those satellites into orbit a parking orbit. That's where they went wrong. It was an eccentric orbit, 350 to 210 kilometers above the Earth. Now if you'll remember what I mentioned the ionosphere was, that's between 100 and 400. Where did he put them? Right in the middle of the ionosphere. And he'd been warned that there was a storm. Well, there was a press release on the 8th of February. 38 of them had been lost. What had happened was that that geomagnetic storm, even though it wasn't a strong one, it lasted a long time. It caused more drag than these spacecraft could cope with. It thickened the ionosphere, that would be my student way of putting it. So there was more drag, so these satellites started to lose height, and, and then they eventually burnt up, 38 of them. So there's a modern day story. So either Musk or his insurers picked up quite a bill for a space weather event that was forecasted, but he didn't quite understand enough about the impact. Well, let's wait three days for the launch. And so to close, I've had a great time this evening giving this talk, and it is a great time to get interested in space weather. Uh, for the next few years, there's another prediction, uh, a, a group of people now saying, oh no, 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 the, the, the things are different, here's a different model of how the sun behaves, and actually this is going to be a bumper cycle all the way out into 2025. We'll see. John will report back in a few years. Um, and you know, as, as a technically minded person in retirement, I'm absolutely delighted to come back into Radio Amateur, which has given me the opportunity to give you this talk this evening. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> um.